IFBC, Pastor Jake wanted to just touch base with you here midweek. Uh, it's been a couple of weeks since I've shared one of these videos and I wanted to just share a little bit with you and celebrate a few things. Uh, one is this awesome coffee bar slash cell phone bar as you walk in. You can, uh, if you turn to your left, there's a really cool space now that Bev has worked on to uh, to be able to facilitate people hanging out, talking. You can charge your phone there. We've got phone chargers. Uh, it's a really welcoming place in our Welcome Center. And I just want to encourage you to take note of that the next time uh, you're in our Welcome Center. I wanted to share just a few things with you regarding our upcoming schedule. So Good Friday is right around the corner, uh, April 7th. Uh, we will be gathering right here at FBC at 6.30 p.m. for a Good Friday service. Lots of music and reflection. There'll be a, a real short message and uh, should be a really sweet time of celebrating the work of Jesus on the cross for us as we take communion together on Good Friday, April 7th, 6.30 p.m. right here. And then Easter Sunday, two days later, April 9th, we'll gather at our normal time, 9.30. Encourage you to be praying about who you will invite to come join us to celebrate the resurrection of King Jesus. 9.30, April 9th, Easter Sunday. Would you pray about inviting someone to come join us? Uh, we'll have a digital invitation ready to go on Facebook that you could share with others. Also, word of mouth is just so, so important and impactful. I want to encourage you to think about who you might invite for Easter Sunday. And then this week, I wanted to share that we've, we've walked through some pretty meaty uh, theological chapters of Romans. The whole book is meaty, but specifically, uh, chapters 9 and 10 are very meaty, and we, we're, we're looking at this reality of God's sovereignty and human responsibility. And this week, as we close chapter 10, uh, we're going to be looking at this, this tension again, and really Paul's focus on human responsibility of responding to the gospel. And I think it's necessary, especially as we seek to have a balanced understanding of what Paul is communicating in Romans to us, that we have a responsibility to respond to the gospel and also to be gospel proclaiming people. Uh, in this section, Paul, Paul shares how beautiful are the feet of those who bring, who herald good news. And I'm looking forward to looking at this passage of scripture together and all that it means for us as followers of Christ and as a church. And then I also just wanted to check in with those of you who were doing a, a read-through plan in the Bible. I know several of you uh, committed to that. Many of you committed to do that in 2023. I'm doing the chronological plan. And uh, I wanted to just share this resource. Uh, for those of you who are doing the chronological plan, you're getting close to the end of Deuteronomy uh, very soon. But this is a re resource from Tim Keller on seeing the gospel in Deuteronomy. And I wanna just share this as I close this video with you. I pray it's an encouragement to you. God bless you as you continue to read through scripture. It is so good for our souls to be able to read through scripture. I'm praying for you. I'm so thankful you're a part of our church. God bless you. The reason that a, that a believer should be obeying the law of God is so that the world will see what a glorious God we have. So when the world sees uh, believers loving one another and doing all the things that the law of God says, you know, not killing, not stealing, not committing adultery, you know, all that, they will look and say, oh, look at what a great God these, these people have. Hi, we are looking at how to discover the gospel in every single book of the Bible. And uh, what we're looking at is each book, and we're asking the question, what's the book about? How does it fit in or move along the biblical storyline? How does it point us to the gospel of grace, and how does it point us to Jesus himself? So. Um, First of all, let's talk about the book of Deuteronomy and what it's about. Now, the word Deuteronomy means the second law, Deutero, Deutero which is second nomos law. And it is talking about the, the fact that when 
uh, the children of Israel got to the promised land and were about to go in, uh, God had told Moses that because of his various failures, he was not going to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. And so when they got to the very threshold of it, uh, Moses preached, basically, if you take a look at the book of Deuteronomy, you realize it's really a, set, a series of Moses' sermons on recapitulating the law of God, especially the Ten Commandments that was received at Mount Sinai 40 years earlier, and going through what the law of God is and how to live in the land and the purpose of the law. And so what you actually have is a recapitulation of how to live life according to God's uh, moral rules and law just before they go into the promised land. That's what it's about. And the outline of the book is fascinating because uh, what many people have pointed out is that in uh, 2,000 years ago, uh, excuse me, 2,000 years before the time of Christ, uh, when the Hittites, which was a great empire, would conquer uh, a, a smaller country, they would create a covenant between the emperor of you know the, the great lord and the vassal state. In other words, if if uh, a particular country was conquered and now they were going to be living under uh, the Hittites, what was the relationship going to be like? And they would put together what was called the Hittite suzerainty treaty because the suzerain was a, a lord. The Hittite suzerainty treaty. Uh, what's fascinating is the book of Deuteronomy is outlined exactly like a Hittite suzerainty treaty. It starts with the preamble, who are the parties? The Lord and his people. It moves into a, a place called the historical prologue where the relationship between God and his people is spelled out, how God led them out of Egypt and how God made his promises and that sort of thing. Then comes the stipulations which is actually the, the law. You, 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 when you see the stipulations, it's the, it's the Ten Commandments. But in the Hittite Suzerainty Treaty, the law was not a way to be saved. It was a way to have a good relationship with the great Lord. So the, the people uh, were, a, were, were doing what, what the great Lord wanted them to do so they could have a, a good relationship, a love relationship with the great Lord. And then finally, after... The preamble, the historical prologue, the, um, uh, the stipulations or the law, and finally the blessings and curses came, which is where the great Lord said, if you obey the law, these are the blessings that you will get, and if you disobey the law, these are the curses that will come down on you. And finally, at the very end, there would be oaths that both, both the, uh, the great Lord and the, the vassals would have oaths. What's fascinating is by Deuteronomy, using that as the actual um, uh, outline. So you basically have uh, chapter one is the preamble, chapter one to four of Deuteronomy is the historical prologue, chapters five to 11 is the stipulations, and then chapters 12 to 26 is the details of the stipulations, meaning the, the law. Chapters um, 27, 28 are the blessings and curses, and then the oaths and witnesses are 29 to 31. That was revolutionary because, first of all, it was showing <laughs> that the relationship of Israel to God, um, that the purpose of the law was not to be saved, but to have a good relationship with God. The reason we were obeying the law of God is to have a love relationship with him, not in order to be saved, not in order to go to heaven. The relationship had already been established by God. The deliverance had already happened. And... The other reason, and Deuteronomy 4 is very clear, the other reason we obey the law of God is to be a witness to the, to the nations. Deuteronomy 4 says the reason that a, that a believer should be obeying the law of God is so that the world will see what a glorious God we have. So when, when the, uh, the, the world sees uh, believers loving one another and doing all the things that the law of God says, you know, not killing, not stealing, not committing adultery, you know, all that, they will look and say, oh, look at what a great God these, this people have. So uh, all religion sees the law of God as being basically a way of salvation, a way you get God to bless you, a way to get God to just do good things for you. But Deuteronomy is an extraordinarily sophisticated way of saying, no, the law of God is there 
in order to have a love relationship with God and also as a way of being a witness to the nations, not as a form of salvation. Now, of course, immediately you begin to see how does that fit in with the rest of the Bible? Now, what that means, of course, is it's pointing to the fact that in the end, Jesus Christ saves us by giving us the blessings of the covenant by taking the curses of the covenant. It says so in Galatians chapter 3. It says Jesus Christ became a curse for us so that we could receive the blessings that were promised. Uh, at the end of Jesus' life, he obeyed the, the covenant perfectly. He should have gotten blessings instead he got the curse. So that at the end of our lives, we get the blessings instead of the curse. He got our curse so that we get his blessings. And if you don't understand Deuteronomy, you do not understand how Jesus Christ, life and death, actually brings about our salvation. The other thing, just to mention rather briefly, is uh, about the way in which um, God uh, shows that salvation is by grace. There's a great place in Deuteronomy 7 where God says to the children of Israel, I didn't love you because you were the greatest of nations. You were actually a small nation. I didn't love you because you were the richest of nations. You're actually a pretty poor nation. I didn't love you because you're a powerful nation. You're actually pretty weak. But I loved you um, because I set my, my love on you. And that's the reason I love you. I'll never forget Dr. Ed Clowney preaching a sermon on this, this um, passage in which he said, do you realize what God is saying? He's saying, let me tell you the reason I love you. I love you just because I love you. I don't love you because you're better or, or because you've done this or you've done that. I just love you because I love you. See, that's grace. And I remember Ed Clowney saying, then he says, men, the next time your wife says, honey, do you love me? Don't say, well, you know, you're a great tennis partner. Uh, don't say, well, you know, I, you're actually pretty good looking. Or don't say, well, you know, it was great to be able to put our two incomes together. He said, boy, that's not love. That's not love. When you love somebody because they're this or that, or they've brought you this or bright, no. Real love is, I love you just because I love you. And God's love is, is the love of grace. It's not the love of, of merit for good works. One more thing. Jesus Christ is the ultimate lawgiver. Moses, of course, gave us the law, and he wrote it, well, he, you know, on tablets. Jesus Christ is the ultimate lawgiver because he writes it on the tablets of your heart. It's very clear by the end of the book, by the way, there's a, at the end of the book of, of Deuteronomy, uh, Moses gives them a song to sing in which the song says, you know, we failed. Mo basically, at the end of Moses' life, he, he says, you know what? Here's what, the way God wants you to live. Here's how you can be a witness to the nations. Here how, here's how you can have a great relationship with God. And you are going to fail. You are absolutely going to fail. Uh, so, boy, that's pretty pessimistic. Well, yes and no. Because Deuteronomy points forward to the fact that Moses was a great man. You know, the meekest man on the face of the earth. He was a great man in many ways, but he was, an, he was an insufficient lawgiver. We need a lawgiver who can write it on the tablets of our hearts, who can change us, and Jesus Christ is the one who did that. And actually, you're never going to actually, you know, commandment number you know, you know, if you go to the fourth commandment, you're never really going to get Sabbath rest unless you get the deeper rest that Jesus Christ brings you in the gospel. You're never going to really, you know, number five, honor your parents unless you get the fatherly love that really, really comforts you in Jesus Christ. You're never going to really be able to get over hatred and bitterness and really forgive unless you get the forgiveness that Jesus Christ gives us. You're never really going to be true to your spouse unless Jesus is your ultimate spouse and you get his spousal love and then that'll keep you from ever being tempted to look for love anywhere else. Did you see? In other words, the reason why you, you, you can not kill, not commit adultery, not steal, uh, the reason you cannot steal is because Jesus Christ has made you wealthy in himself so that now you're, you're, not, you're not greedy for, for money. In fact, you can give it away. Uh, Jesus Christ is the ultimate lawgiver who not only writes it on our hearts, but actually gives us the resources we need to satisfy the law of God. And so Jesus Christ is the true Moses, and that's the way we can be absolutely sure that when we embrace the law of God, 
that we are going to be able to honor God, be a witness to the nations, and know Him well.